so my name is Joanne Watterson-Lynch. When I, when I left school, I was interested in economics and environment and basically social stuff too, you know, social equity. And I enrolled in a degree to be an environmental economist and I'm in university since like 12 years ago. Um, and in many ways, I think my perspective at the time wasn't that different to a lot of my generation that, that I didn't know the word social enterprise, but I knew there was something about um, business and the economy in general I wanted to understand and there was something about um, creating a, a better future, you know, um, we were cognizant of ecological issues and, and kind of social disparity. So the question was, well, what's the best kind of institutional model to address that? And if you looked at, if at that time, you know, if I looked across three sectors, you, or you can go into business and the private sector and, and do that, or you can go into government, or you can go into this sort of third sector NGO space. Um, and eventually that's what I did, you know, years later, after graduating in international studies from here. But the challenge I saw in the NGO world was, um, were a few. One of them is that inability to raise and manage their own revenue. So there's a kind of cycle of dependency on either public money or um, you know, public money from the government or public money, direct donations. Um, a lot of NGOs now are trying to move to an income generating service provider model. We'd have these programs and we'd raise this much money for three years to enact it, but you always had the gun to your head of the funding cycle on one level. Um, so it didn't have that, and the funding itself was so tied to rigid um, series of expectations that that kind of whole lean adaptive startup thing that um, you see in, in the best examples of, of startups, but also we're starting to see um, just in the way that people collaborate online now. Um, it was very difficult to do in that environment because you're actually locked in to these agreements. I worked with a program called Are You Making a Difference in Schools? And what we were really modelling was micro examples of social entrepreneurship in, in schools. So we'd go in and we'd, we'd facilitate a discussion about values and, and ethics. Um, you know, with students from primary school to high school. So it's like, well, what's, what's important to you, you know? Um, and then we'd look at uh, scenarios in the school or the community or any kind of context where those students um, were familiar with where what they saw didn't sort of shape up with the way they thought things should be or could be. And then we'd do like a rapid prototyping thing. We didn't call it that, but like what's something, what's like a little experiment we could design um, that might create some impact on, on that issue. But I ended up writing my honours thesis about it, about the program, about the experience, and in many ways about some of the challenges I saw working in school environments with the structure of the way, um, the business of education, if you like. And also, I got really interested in, um, in individual meaning making, in psych development, but just how do, how do in, that, in that context, young people, how do they make sense of the world that they're seeing and their own place in it? How do they make sense of themselves and their own efficacy, their, their agency? Um, and so the, these terms social enterprise and social innovation sort of you know, popped up. They've been around for a while, but they seem to really, over the last 10 years, um, become more visible to the extent that a, a university like this is putting on, from what I can tell, the first major conference in Australia with this in the centre of it. Um, and I think that reflects a couple of things. Like one is the, the sort of under 35, under 30 cohorts desire to not just see business as usual, to see um, business, even if it's business business, you know, for profit business connecting um, with things they see as important, environment, you know, more positive social outcomes. Um, so that's one. Not under that term, you know, because I, I to be honest, I see the, the term social enterprise as a bit of a transitional Thing. So there's a sort of process of um, these terms that are, that, are, that are new and strange and exotic um, that are put out there and there's this declarative sort of moment of what does this mean? Oh, I choose to align myself or, or you know, argue against that. But as sort of the, the centre of gravity of culture catches up to that, um, they just get woven into the fabric of, of the everyday. But if we look at social enterprise, I mean, one, one way to look at it is 
the technical definition of the government's, you know, blah, 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 to be classified as a social enterprise, you need to have this mix of whatever that is. That's fine, but it's also, I, I think that's, um, you know, at times seeing the trees but not seeing the forest here. So then there's this broader idea of what are the ethical responsibilities of engaging in work today? You know, if you're going to start a business, um, what is the responsibility as a citizen to the impact of, of what that business does, um, including where the money comes from, the way finance works? So that question I'm sort of more interested in rather than uh, social enterprise is the answer. Um, I think social enterprise is a transitionary term to point to something that's happening in the culture, um, which is a demand for greater accountability around the impact of what work does, the impact of our institutions, and an acknowledgement that the old models of solving problems, um, i.e. if it's a social issue, government sort of tries to pull these levers at a distance um, and either regulate or, <clears throat> or direct funding to something, a recognition that that's um, slow and in, sometimes ineffective. You know, we don't want to get rid of it. It's been fabulous in many ways, but it's um, the rapidity of change now is such that that model doesn't seem to be able to um, keep up with the changes that we see. So you think of something like WikiLeaks. You know, <laughs> the ability now for digital disruption to completely shift the way things are done. It's very hard for policymakers to foresee, um, foresee that. Yet also, we don't want to do things at a policy kind of institutional environment level that shuts down innovation and experimentation either. So uh, the advantage I see with social enterprise is this um, on one uh, headline around values connecting, okay, business can actually be meaningful and have um, great impact in the world, explicit impact. Um, it's not just about maximizing profitability for shareholders or business owners, yet also this ability for series of micro experiments. So you get students now coming through where they'll go, you know what, I don't really want to go for a big, work for a big company and I don't really want to go work for a big charity. I want to, I've gotten really passionate about Cambodia and, you know, um, child trafficking. And so I want to create this little experimental um, enterprise that could have an impact on that and then see what we learn from that. Now that happening all around the world, millions of those. You know, that's quite interesting. The challenge is like, well, how do, you, how do you get the efficiency gains of joining these things up and scaling? So to go to your question, did I have um, an aha moment about social enterprise? Not particularly, except that it's a useful label. Did I have an aha moment about um, how I see these systems evolving in the world and my own place in it? Like every friggin' day, you know? I mean, that's <laughs> like that's, that's part of what, what what, what I do, you know, and what I'm interested in, in terms of a life journey. Um, there was a moment when I finished my honours degree and I, I was like, well, the plan I'd had was to go straight into a PhD and, you know, run ahead and, and sort of climb the academic echelons. And I guess um, that was when I discovered the term and this world out there, this bubbling world of experimentation, around, with, uh, often under the label of social entrepreneurship. And there was a very conscious decision to not continue to just climb um, <clears throat> the academic staircase and go into the world. You know, the, you know, I, the categories are problematic. You know, I'm not saying academia is not the world, but in this case, it was like push out and um, and just do some stuff. You know, work for organisations, create little um, startup projects. You know. So I've been immersed in that world for the last um, three years in Argentina um, and Latin America broadly, but based in Argentina, yeah. So I do a lot, I'm connected to Hub Melbourne, I do a lot of stuff with them. I worked on setting up a hub in Buenos Aires for the last few years. Um, I, I'm enrolled in a PhD program looking at um, collaboration and this sort of stuff, social enterprise and power. Um, and I do a lot of work at the moment with a group called Collab Forge. So we, that's kind of government 2.0, open government. How does um, digital disruption and new technologies open a moment of possibility for the way governance is done? You know, like, like Wikipedia for policy type stuff. So I could say, yes, I'm involved in a lot of things around this sector. Do I have my little project that I kind of um, coalesce my own identity with? No. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One of them is 
some personality types um, are really good at that lead entrepreneur sort of this is my thing and everyone goes basically name that project you know it connects them I don't want to give examples because but you know who you are right um, and and you know I really admire that because it, it takes a certain it takes an incredible level of perseverance and a particular kind of leadership I think my own role and my own skill set is um, I'm more of a storyteller around what's happening, maybe evident by my responses. Um, so I like to work in a consulting fashion. I like to work with a community or an organization and kind of go in and say, well, you know, this is happening and this is happening and, and, and in a sense tell and craft a narrative that makes sense for people. Um, so that's, that's a lot of the work that I do. And I think whilst, you know, with any, any change movement, you've got these um, agents that go out and do stuff and then you've got agents that make sense of what's happening um, and I would say that's as a vital part of this whole stuff as um, the, ex the bubbling experiments you know so when I think of social enterprise I mean there's these two there's kind of two characters that stand out historically and one is is a social entrepreneurship I mean Bill Drayton with Ashoka in the, the States um, and Michael Young in the UK so there's sort of a school of School of Social Entrepreneurs that's out here that was related to that lineage and then there's Ashoka, it's a Bill Drayton thing and they were both, they're actually a little different but if the Drayton model was what if you took the best of, um, you know, aspiration for creating a better world that you see in NGOs and in the EPA and stuff and took the best of kind of the McKinsey business consultant kind of kick ass um, guys that know how to get stuff done and you know build a business model and all that. What if you combine them together so it was in service of the whole yet um, with that agility and sort of brilliance that you sometimes see in business. Um, like one, the first answer I could say is um, that the term actually becomes meaningless you know because it's like what do you mean you're not so you know you're not responsible you know. Um, that in itself, it's easy to say, um, that in itself will require, I think, some shifts in the legal categories. So you get things like B Corp coming out now, you know, B Lab from the States, and it's like, I don't think this has been as um, high pressure in this country, but in the States, the classic move was, well, the CEO wants to do something around corporate social responsibility, and like legally written into the contract is maximizing profitability for shareholders. So how do you create how do you, in a sense, free the legal constraints on um, CEOs, particularly publicly, com publicly listed companies, to enact world-centric values, to enact um, and embody in their organization a concern for the planet and the people that live on it, you know? And if, if fundamentally written into the legal structure of the corporation is a punishment for doing that, um, and we have to remember that a lot of the, the sort of legal architecture and the imagination of the corporation itself goes back a few hundred years to the, to the sort of the pillar and plundage, uh, plunder and pillage model of, of Europe, you know. I think in the Briti British East India Company and the Dutch East India Company and, you know, these sort of, it was very much um, how to build a joint stock operation, you know, build a joint stock company, raise some capital, go over, take, 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 plunder, you know, bring back for king and country. Mm. Um, and so one, you get two things, you get woven into um, the psychological fabric of liberalism in many ways, that that is a valid act that, and you still hear this all the time, right, and economists and, you know, utility is maximized when individual businesses um, just pursue their own profit and they don't faff around with, you know, second guessing what the public good is, they just go, bam, you know, offer a product for your market, if, if the people validate it through buying it, even if it makes them sick or whatever, like cigarettes, you know, that, that's fine. Who's to say, who's to second guess that? So you've got this kind of as a, as a philosophical idea, and then you have it enacted in legal structures where it's like you are legally required to do that. Um, <clears throat> so I, that's why I see social enterprise as this sort of transitory term to say, what if business could, could be something different? Ideally, I think that, would, that wouldn't need to be there in, in, in 30 years, you know, just like, we don't have those transitory structures of a bicycle now, we have the kind of latest ones generally, you don't have daddy farthings and these sort of early experimentations. Um, yeah, then, then it goes to the question of like, what does business look like in 30 years? And I think that opens up much broader questions around mechanization of labor and, you know, 
meaningfulness of work that's that's much broader than just, you know, is it business the way it is at the moment or is it social enterprise? I see it all the day at places like Hub. You'll get someone 23, like um, super bright, you know, they've gone through commerce or they've done, you know, engineering or something. They've, they've, they've um, worked in a management consulting firm for three years, you know, Bain or something, Booz and Allen. Um, and, and they're done, they drop out. And it's not that they couldn't continue. I mean, the, it's actually the problem is they could continue and they could see themselves climbing ladders and earning more money. But there's this question around what is the real meaning behind this? Like, what is the purpose of my work in the world? Once I've been patted on the head and ticked the boxes and yeah, I can do it and I can do the project and get the outcomes and I've made money for the partners. So there's this question in our culture, which is, which is much bigger than social enterprise. Like, what is the purpose of work? Like, why do we do it? In a culture of relative, I mean, super abundance historically. Thank you.